Alright, hey everyone, welcome back to another week's Sushi Squad design training. Today we're going to be talking about pivots, bearings, and actuators. So, yes, let's sir. get right into it. Um, so, to reintroduce us for those who haven't um, been at these trainings before, I'm Abi. I'm a senior on Team 7461, I'm the team captain, and I like oranges. Hey guys, I'm Max. I'm a junior at Redmond High School. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the design lead of this team, and uh, I like pairs. Alright, so first we're going to talk about motors, <laughs> which are, well, they're probably the most common method of power transmission, or like, power conversion from electrical to mechanical energy in the world. And here's how you make things spin. So, motors convert electrical power into mechanical power. What that means is they... So, power is the rate at which energy is transferred. So, electrical power is measured as the voltage um, times the current. And we'll get into that in a future video on the physics of it all. Um, but what you have to know for right now is voltage is basically just how, how fast electricity is moving and currents measuring how much electricity is moving. Um, that's a very oversimplified model, but yeah. Um, then you've, it's also m measured as torque times the rotations per minute. So that's when you're, uh, you, when you've got physical rotational motion. Or if you've got linear motion, it's measured at the force times the linear speed. And it's basically the rate at which you are transferring energy from uh, one thing to another. And motors use a mechanical field to, uh, mag magnetic field to work, excuse me. And they basically use um, electromagnets. As you can see in this background, um, they use these copper windings and create a magnetic field that um, makes the motor turn. So, um, FRC motors usually start out with high speed and low torque, meaning they spin really fast, but they don't have much force to actually push something with. So you, so they require a gear reduction, which is basically just taking a, um, we covered this last time, but it's basically using gears to actually um, go from a high speed low torque motor to a low speed high torque output. And um, finally, they generally require sensors and software to control position. So if you're trying to control the p position very precisely, you're going to want some sort of sensor on there as well as some sort of control loop. Alright, so terminology about motor. So, first of all, the free speed of a motor is the speed when you've got no load. So, for example, if the motor isn't pushing anything and you're just holding it and it's spinning in your hand, that's what the free speed is. Um, it's obviously, the free speed is a theoretical value because you're never actually going to reach that speed. You're going to come pretty close. But because there's friction in the shaft and stuff, you're never actually going to, going to hit that free speed, um, though you will come very, very close. Um, stalling is when a motor isn't rotating despite an applied voltage. So if you hold the motor shaft in place and it's trying to rotate, but the force you're putting on it is equal to the force it's putting on you, that's sort of what stalling is. And the stall torque is, at a given voltage, how much torque can it put out before it stalls? So like, um, if, so what that means is it can essentially lift, the, well, it can resist that much load before it stops moving. Or actually, no, it resists that much load when it is not moving. So I guess that means like, the stall torque is sort of like, if you're applying a torque of, say, 5 newton meters on it, and the motor's stall torque is 5 newton meters, it won't move. So, um, what that means is, uh, I guess, stalling for long periods of time can also damage the motor, um, because, um, we'll get into this in the next part, actually, it's because of efficiency. So, efficiency is the percent of power inputted to percent power outputted. So, you've got your highest efficiency at 50% of free speed. So, percent of power converted just means what percent of the input electrical power goes into mechanical power on the output. So, you've got your highest efficiency at half of the free speed, so um, right here, as you can see, this, this graph sort of graphs the efficiency. Um, well, 
actually depends on the um, motor. Um, highest efficiency is actually um, generally somewhere around the middle. As you can see, highest efficiency here is sort of a bit higher. But your um, the peak power, so the maximum output power, is going to be at half the free speed. Um, and that's a typo on my part. But um, you've also got... Um, so, at the very... When you've got, uh, I guess... Um, what am I saying? So when you've got your motor is at its free speed, so right about here, and it's, um, I guess, spinning with no load, then it's got zero power, because even though it's spinning, there's no torque, right? Because there's no load on it, so therefore the power is going to be zero. Similarly, when you're at, um, when it's stalled, meaning it's not unable to move because it's putting a lot of torque out, uh, what's going to happen is you, um, you've got no output power, because even though it's got a lot of torque, it's not spinning at all. So no energy is being transferred. Um, so what that means is that when, you've, when your motor isn't moving, then, or it's moving with no load, it's going to have z zero power. And so, um, yeah, that's why you should always gear such that your load on your motor matches the torque that the motor will put out at half of its free speed. Um, because what that does is essentially means your power is maximized. So for whatever output you have, like say you have to lift, um, say that you're, you have to lift five pounds. If you're gearing such that your motor, the load your motor has to put out is equivalent to the load it would put out in the peak power region, it would actually, um, it would, uh, uh, shoot, how do I phrase this? It would, it would move that five pounds the fastest the motor possibly could because you're gearing such that the power is maximized. It's a bit complicated, but, um, yeah, it takes a bit of time to understand. If anyone has questions, just feel free to message me or go over this video again. Um, and fi um, finally, the thermal mass is sort of the ma amount of mass on a motor that the motor can dump heat into. So a bigger motor can stall for longer because of the fact that um, you're fundamentally... Uh, you've got more heat that the motor can dissipate. And if you stall for too long of a period of time, it can cause heat damage to the motor, known as burning out. Um, Alright, so someone in chat asked what I'm talk. uh, is there anything important they need to know about motors? Alright, so I'll just go back for a second, um, basically... Oh, wait, Abby, 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 hold up. It might be helpful to do something, uh, to have, give an example with, uh, like a back, let's start with a 775 motor, right? Like, it has a free speed of, like, 19,000. Oh, yeah, sure, so, so, um, I guess, uh... Hmm. An example of this might be this mini sim motor. So this is a motor curve. Which is which essentially shows how what the torque is for a given speed, um, what the free how the free speed um, like you've got speed on this axis, um, and then it just basically shows off shows a bunch of statistics relative to speed. So like for example, at speed zero, you're stalling your motor, meaning it's outputting one point four one newton motors in the uh, newton meters in the case of this um, um, mini sim motor. And then, as you move, at, I guess, as your torque, as the torque you need to put out decreases, that means your motor is going to be spinning faster. Because, um, in general, as you sort of, you need to put out more force to keep spinning when you've got more load on it. And as a consequence, when your motor is going slower, um, you're going to, it's going to be putting out more torque to sort of resist, um, whatever is causing it to spin slower. And so... Right, just, just, I guess one thing, um, like when you're reading a motor graph like this, it's uh, really important to understand what it's like kind of, what it's showing and like what the axes are. 
like, for example, when I first saw Motograph, I had no idea what it was saying. But then if you read, if you look at the axes, right, it, it's basically three stacked graphs on top of each other. So it has a, an efficiency axis. Uh, sorry, the x axis is speed. One, there's, and there's three y axes. One is efficiency, uh, one is current, and one is torque. Yeah. So, so um, yeah. So just, I'll go ahead. Yeah. So basically, what that does is it um, sort of tells you at a given speed how will how much torque will the motor be putting out, how much um, speed will it be putting out, or like how fast it will. Wait. At a given speed, how much torque will it be putting out? How efficient will it be? And how much current will it be drawing? Or, um, or how much output power? Um, so it's actually four stacked graphs. Yeah, true. You're right. Yeah. So, again, sort of the rationale behind and how a motor behaves is if you've ever say taken a motor or something that spins and held it, and and prevented it from spinning. It has to put more power into sort of resisting whatever is pushing on it. And as a consequence, it can put less of that power into spinning fast. Um, yeah, that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah, by the way, we, we don't recommend uh, ever trying to stop a motor with your hands. <laughs> and it depends on how, how powerful. So somebody asked in chat, <laughs> oh if you're using two motors in a gearbox, you just multiply the torque by two. Yeah, so um, if you've got two motors, then um, what you want to do is, again, you want to gear such that the torque on each motor is such that the motors are at half of the, the... The torque the motors are putting out is the torque at half of their free speed. So here that torque would be around 0 0.8 newton meters. So you want to gear such that the amount of load on each motor is such that they are rotating at half their free speed because that's when you're they're putting out the most power. For sure. Yeah, so um, we'll be sending out some resources later um, with, I guess, more detailed explanations of the equations that go into motors. Yeah, there are also some calculators that you can use, but it's always good to understand the physics. Um, so for two mini sims, I'd want them to be putting out 1.4 newton meters of torque. Um, so for two for two mini sims in particular, you'd want each to be putting out 0 0.7 newton meters of torque, or in total, yes, you'd want them to be putting out 1.4 newton meters. So you'd gear such that your output load, by the time it's on the mini sims is a uh, 0 0.7 newton meters for per each for each yeah i i think i think that's that's a lot of information to take in yeah it, it's um, this is pretty information dense um we'll definitely put out some more resources but yeah all right so brushless motors um so brushless motors are a type of motor that essentially use more advanced electrical systems to be more efficient. They don't wear down over time either. So brush motors are like the motor we talked about earlier, the um, mini sim, and you don't need to know too much about how they work. There are YouTube videos that explain them much better than I can. But the gist of it is they don't wear out over time and they're more efficient than brush motors, but they require sensors to even move. So you want to avoid putting them on either really simple parts that don't need the... Like, for example, if you don't really care about efficiency, um, you might just use a, like, a brush motor, even if it's less efficient, just because, say, on an intake, you don't really care about efficiency or how much power you're putting out. But um, the other thing is you want to avoid putting them on parts of the robot that extend outside of your frame perimeter, just because if they... If they're exposed to the impacts from other robots, then um, if they if the sensor cable gets severed or something, you have to place your motor controller electronics near the motor because the encoder the sensor cables are relatively short. So what that means is generally you if your say intake is extending outside of your robot's protected frame, if another robot hits that and accidentally ripped the encoder cable out or say um, which could damage your motor or if they ripped the actual um, motor controller off 
what that does is it actually, um, if, well, one, your motor controller is, um, if it's connected to the rest of your robot's, um, sort of, uh, electrical bus, that means your entire robot's disabled now. But also, that can just cause serious damage to the brushless motors and it's not really worth it. So, in general, we'll, what we do is we just use brushed motors on things that extend outside of our frame perimeter. Yeah, and, and, and brushless motors are pretty expensive. Uh, brushless. So that's a, yeah, that's a pretty big a part of it. Um, yeah. I, if you if you don't didn't understand like some of the electrical terminology, I, I recommend you watch the electrical training video that we put out. Um, I think it should be on our YouTube channel. I think Justin did that two weeks ago. All right. So pneumatics. So this is the other main way of sort of transferring power in FRC. Um, it's basic. It basically involves, um, I guess, using air to push a cylinder. So, um, it uses pressurized air to push a cylinder. Um, it's got two possible states. So, a pneumatic cylinder can either be out or in. There's no in-between. And then you've also got... Um, the, the drawback of using pneumatics is that even though they're really simple, because they, um, they only exist in two states, and you don't need to worry about chain or belts or anything, um, so they make design and programming easier. But they complicate wiring, and you need to account for air tanks, um, air hoses, all that good stuff. So pneumatic tubing, um, a compressor, everything on the robot. And so that makes that a lot more complex. So pneumatics are o only really useful for simple two-position pivots or two-position mechanisms. So you don't want to use a pneumatic on something that needs to exist in more than two states, because a pneumatic cylinder is... It can only be out or in. And some terminology for a cylinder. So the bore is the de So basically, the way a cylinder works, this is a side profile, but it's got this circle that exists in, the, in this tube, and then you've got air pushing on it, and it's got a rod attached to that circle. So the bore is the diameter of that circle. So if this were one inch long, that would be a one inch bore. And the pressure, so pressure is sort of just how pressurized something is, um, not pretty intuitive. Um, it's measured in pounds of force experienced per square inch. And so the force of a pneumatic cylinder is going to be the area of that bore circle. So if your bore is one inch in diameter, um, you'd have so the radius would be half an inch, then multiply, by, then square that and multiply by pi for the area. Um, that's just geometry. And then you multiply that times the PSI, so pounds per square inch, to get the force. So, for example, let's say we had um, something that existed. Here, I'm going to pull up a, a notepad real quick. Um, Alright. Um, what the heck? Uh, Alright, so this is the whiteboard. So, let's say we've got um, our pneumatic cylinder. Let's say our, our bore is 2 inches. Oh, wait, I'm going to just use this text tool. Cause, so, I can't type today, but... Um, Oh, is anyone, somebody said they couldn't hear, is anyone else experiencing that? Oh wait, if they couldn't hear, they wouldn't be able to hear me. Okay, um, yeah, it looks like that's an issue on your end. Uh, might want to refresh the page or check if you accidentally muted the stream. Um, so your bore, let's say your bore is 2 inches. Then, um, and you've got 60 pounds per square inch. So the force your um, pneumatic cylinder would be putting out would be, um, so if your bore diameter is 2 inches, then your radius is 1 inch. Then um, then you square that, that's still 1, So and then multiply by pi, um, and that's the area of your circle. Um, and then you multiply that by 60. So what you get is you get 60 pi, so the force would be 60 pi pounds or um, 
uh, roughly 188 um, pounds of force. Alright, so... Yeah, um, that's, I guess, the physics of this. Um, Alright, let's, uh... Wait, uh... Alright, so, now we're gonna talk about bearings. Yeah, I love bearings. Bobby, do you like bearings? Sure. I do. Alright, um... Oh, one more thing about pneumatic cylinders that I just realized I forgot to mention because I'm stupid. You've got... So you've got two types of pneumatic cylinders. Single acting cylinders and double acting cylinders. So single acting cylinders only push one it one way and then have a spring pull it back. And double acting cylinders actually use air to push both ways. So in FRC, generally speaking, you only want to use single acting cylinders because I mean double acting cylinders. My bad. Um, because single acting cylinders actually, uh, what they do is uh, they. They're less consistent than double acting cylinders, and you usually don't need to save the air that you'd save by using a single acting cylinder. Avi, you're forgetting magnetic cylinders, bro. No, no, I'm not. Mag um, magnets and cylinders are usually used to measure position for weird applications. They don't actually retract the thing. But yeah, I know, but I guess, I, okay, I guess it's not a separate type. Because I guess those are still double acting. Don't, if you need to measure your position, just use a freaking motor. That's true. Okay, right, cool. So bearings. bearings. Yeah. Right into it. Alright, yeah, just, I guess, what are bearings? Well, the purpose of bearings, right, is to reduce friction. Um, when you're, ro when you're, uh, when you're, when you're rotating something in a, in a hole, it's going to produce a lot of friction. Um, Especially in robot, Avi. Can you mute your mic, please? Very loud and distracting, Avi. Thank you, sir. My mic was muted. But oh, I mean, I heard something on your end. My bad. Oh wait, okay, it was only so, muted for the stream. Okay. Um. So yeah, so it reduces friction. Like if you have maybe like a rod in a a closed fit hole, which is a like a very um tight hole. It's and you try to rotate that rod. It's gonna be really hard, right? Because the hole is like very close to the, to the diam outer diameter of the rod, and so it's going to produce a lot of friction. Um, and so the goal of bearings is, is reduce that friction, help things you know, um, turn, turn more smoothly. Uh, they provide a, you know, lubricated or rolling surfaces in order to, to, to uh, reduce that friction. Uh, like if you, you, know, if you see the, the bearings on the, on the bottom, um, they have multiple components. I just want to go over them really quick just to get those out of the way. Um, if you see on the right of that bottom left image, that's called the inner race of a bearing. So a bearing, how, um, at least a ball bearing, um, or, a, yeah, sorry, at least, um, yeah, for, for multi-part bearings. So we'll get into the different dichotomy of the bearings. But um, for this bearing, uh, the inner race is that um, little, little inner ring you, you see there. And that provides a track for the, balls to run to roll around on which is why it's called a race and so um and then obviously on on the race there are various uh various balls um and they're perfectly for they're very uh uniform in shape and they roll really nicely and those balls are secured in position and um you know relative to each other by a um by a separator if you see on the on the left um component uh, the, the the left hand side of that bottom left image um like you can't really see the balls you see mostly like the outer outer parts of the separator and those are like um like riveted together and um and those basically separate the balls into like compartments almost so that they don't run into each other and uh outside of everything is the outer race and outer race just provides the outside of the the track for the balls to roll around and that provides a very very efficient um rolling motion or a spin like um spinning motion axis of rotation that's what the that's the terminology i was looking for 
and um yeah and if you if you look at the middle image that's uh, that's what we call a bushing which is a type of bearing and we'll get more into that in the next slide um yeah but just wanted to like emphasize that loads on bearings do exist even though they're very efficient and they allow for a very efficient um a like ro rotation around an axis they do have loads and um if you don't manage the loads correctly then it will decrease the efficiency efficiency of the bearing um like on the rightmost image <laughs> this very sad looking bearing <laughs> Um, I think this is like a car or a machine bearing probably that had like an impact um, and so it crushed part of the um, part of the race and the bearings and the ball bearings inside. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a very extreme example, a non FRC example of when you don't manage loads correctly or something happens and loads are not distributed properly. All right, yeah, so again, I mentioned earlier there's a lot of different bearings and there's a lot of different ways to optimize, like um, to find the optimal bearing for your application. Um, so obviously, the main, di a, a big difference uh, between bearings are their roller profiles. Um, if, you, if you look at the, oh, oh actually, let, let's first talk about the different types of bearings. There's, there's bearings. Bearing is a, is a very big umbrella term. Like, um, if you see here, there's like a ball bearing, there's a roller bearing, there's a bushing, and there's a pin, there's a needle bearing. These are all classified as bearings, and there's there's two main I say I would say types of bearings. There's um or two categories of bearings. There's multi-part bearings and there's single-part bearings. And single-part bearings we just call bushings because um, or or sleeve bearings. But uh, yeah, I'll just call them bushings. Um, if you can see the uh, third from the left, that that picture is a bushing because it's only one part as compared to the other bearings which have multiple parts. Yeah, so bushings so, are just really, really lubricated surfaces. They've usually got some right, sort right, of yeah. oil embedded in them, which makes them really slippy. Or right, they're exactly. So, yeah, so it's it's not like you're sticking another metal ring and that produces just much as much friction as like if you didn't have that in the first place. It, it it's it is it does um it does reduce friction to some extent. And I'll talk about the different properties of each one of these bearings. Um. So uh, the thing with bushings, right, is that um, th because they don't have those like very like very uh, smooth and uniform um, components that roll around inside the the races, it's just like a, a sleeve, right? Um, and as Abby said, it has usually has some oil embedded inside that when um, like friction is applied, the oil is released and then it self lubricates. Um, so those. Um, and because of that, like they do, they do reduce free friction. It is um, relatively effective, but it's it, it produces much higher um, amounts of friction than, let's say, like a ball bearing. And but it also handles loads better because um, it doesn't have as many small um, and I would say like crushable parts. <laughs> That's a nice way to um, visualize how that load is that load is distributed because it's just one solid piece. And so that's why um, bushings are used more in, in uh, like in applications where like friction um, doesn't have to be like super low, and also there's a lot of load being applied to those uh, axes of rotation. Um, moving on, um, in multi in multi part bearings like the ball bearings, the roller bearings, and needle bearings. Um, so uh, these bearings have a lot of components inside, obviously. Like, I, I think I went over in the last slide, the ball bearing has, um, you know, the races, the separators, and the balls. Um, yeah, and the same thing applies to needle bearings, which is on the very left, a uh, very right, and the roller bearing, which is in, some, uh, in the middle. Um, and, like, these also have the same, relatively same amount of components. And so, um, and because of how the um, how they're very uniform, very uh, small, like little rolly bits, right? So it, it reduces friction a lot more than like a a, a bushing. Uh, like I think I, I read somewhere that ball bearings are like 99% uh, um, efficient. Um, meanwhile, like roller bearings, which is the one in the middle with all the little uh, cylindrical rollers, because they have a larger contact surface um, as compared to like the, the how the ball bearings, the balls roll, um, how contact the raceways on one point, right? But the the roller bearings, the cylinders, they contact them on a on a flat surface, on like a um on a on a line, I guess. 
And so that that create makes them have less efficiency, but they also handle load better because um, the contact point isn't is uh, larger, and so the load is spread out more. Um, yeah, and then needle bearings. Uh, needle bearings very limited application because they have they um, actually have a lot more friction because obviously because their their contact point is a lot uh, larger than the the roller bearing and the ball bearing, but they also because their roller profiles are so thin and so like long, they don't handle load as loads as well. So needle bearings are only pretty much used when you want to have a very um, a very small difference between the outer diameter of the shaft and the in and the diameter of the hole which you're going to put the bearing in right if you can see here yeah, the needle so, bearing has uh, very uh small thickness yeah so the needle bearings are primarily used when you need something that's spinning really fast so you can't use a bushing because bushings still generate a, still have a decent amount of friction um when spinning right. really fast um so when you're spinning really fast um but you don't have, um, let's say, when you're spinning really fast, um, like, but you don't have the clearance for a bearing. So it's really just when you want a small pivot, like, or a small um, bearing size, like a bushing, but you're operating at high speeds where you can't use a bushing without it generating a decent amount of heat. Yeah, yep. needle bearing yep. is the rightmost one for a person sure. in chat. Um, yeah. So right. I I think oh wait you just I think um ball bearing I don't think I ever told you guys like the efficiencies like ball bearings are ninety nine percent efficient I think roll bearings are like ninety five percent efficient and bushings are like eighty eighty percent efficient I I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly but uh, those are just like random numbers that you probably don't really need to know yeah it just kind of it kind of shows you like the uh, how how they're you know compared to each other and their performance if uh, something's spinning very fast then use a ball bearing. Or needle bearing, but if you're if something's not spinning very fast, then use a bushing because it's generally going to be a lot easier to do um, and more compact. All right, so pivots. Pivots, awesome. All right, yeah. So um, pivots, right? There's a pivot. Um, I would I would describe as a basically. Uh, an axis where you're um, where you're moving something around, right? So, in robotics, like you would have a pivot for like an arm, or in, like an actuating intake, uh, that kind of stuff. And so, let's just talk about the components of a pivot and how to make a successful pivot. Um, well, the first component is obviously like power transmission. Um, this is going to reference a lot of material from uh, our past lessons when we talk about power transmission, but um. You want to transmit power from one axis to another, right? So maybe that axis could be um, like from a motor driving like an initial like a sprocket, and then that sprocket um, being chained to another sprocket, like the one shown um, in the die in the picture. This picture is a little it's very uh, pretty cluttered and complex because it's from a Citrus Circuits uh, robot. I think the 2019 robot. So uh, I'll I'll explain that a little more later, but. Um, you you want some 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 form of power out, power output right you want either motor or pneumatics like Abi mentioned earlier in this lesson to provide power for your to, to move the pivot um and then uh, you also want gear chain belt which is what we talked about in the power transmission lesson um these are all ways that you can transfer uh power from from one axis to another like if you have a motor and then you you know have gears doing that or chain or belt um. Yeah, and then you also want to re reduce friction at the axis of rotation as much as possible. Um, obviously, you want your pivot to function as efficiently as possible. You want your motor to have as little work to do as possible. Um, and also, you want your ma the, the, the materials that you use and the, and the components that you use to wear out as slowly as possible, to have the longest lifespan. So that's why you want to re obviously reduce um, load on those areas. Um, okay. Okay, so if you look at the diagram, right? Uh, not the diagram, just the, the, a screenshot of um, 1678 Citrus Circus's Citrus Circuits CAD um, from 2019. You can see that this is like a portion of their ball intake. Um, and so let's see, what should we start with? Oh, let's start with the power. Yo, Max, power do you want me to open up the CAD? 
Oh yeah, yeah, sure. That'd be actually really awesome. Okay, I'm waiting on it to open. So. Yeah, it's 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 a, it has a lot of um, components, so it's gonna take a while to load. It's much better in 3D than in 2D. For sure, I try to capture kind of like the entire. Oh, um, the, the person oh, Max, in the I chat accident, asked I accidentally what disconnected, the so uh, just reset, oh. restate whatever you were going to say. Okay, uh, so um, the person in the chat just said, uh, asked what the spring is for. I, the spring is for, I believe, tensioning the... Um, we can take a look at it. the 3D CAD. Okay, it's open, yeah, yeah. so... Uh, can you re me, re share your screen on Discord? Yeah, give um, me a sec to uh, do that. Um, uh, let's see. Alright, so All right. that's the 3D CAD here. I'll share I'll share my screen max. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Alright, so this is their three three dimensional CAD. Um, uh, can you zoom into their their intake? Wait, which oh gosh, which part of their I intake? I think it's on the top. It's on the top, I think. Yeah, oh. yeah. Um let's see the belt run. The sign of the belt run, the, like the chain run up there? Uh yes I do. Okay, so. Uh, wait, yes. where? What is that spring for? Oh, that springs for tensioning the ropes that their um lift that pull their lift up, and we'll get into rope driven lifts in a later class. But yeah, they're That's for. That's a fun one. Oh boy, fun is a word to describe it. <laughs> okay, but if you can see here, right there, um, the the I think they use a motor, a seven seven five, um, to drive this uh, chain run. Oh shoot, uh, uh, here, give me a sec. Everything sort of just... Oh, this is awesome. Epic. Uh, where is the motor? Yeah, so, so, yeah, they've got a motor right here that drives oh, they got, they, this... Yeah, they got a whole, like, uh, power transmission, a whole, like, a uh, gear train. Yeah, so it drives then, the set um, of gears that drive this sprocket, that drives this, um, that drives this uh, arm, and for tensioning, something neat is... Uh, they've got this. They've got this sprocket mounted in the sliding slot that they can then tighten down. They can sort of push into the chain run to sort of tighten it and then tighten that sprocket down, which is pretty neat. Yeah, that is pretty neat. Um, yeah, but so this this chain run, right? This is um, if you look at the, uh, can you pan up a little bit, Abby? Uh, if you see here, they have some bushings. These are uh, the the blue flange things. Yeah. Um, here, this is a better. These are. This is yeah. Better these are view. flanged bushings. Um. So again, like these are like the ones we saw earlier, except they have an outer flange to help with um to help with like uh, retention. So it handles like um. By the way, for load. clarification, a flange here. I'm just gonna hide other um, isolate real quick. Uh. So the flange is this little bit that sticks out and gets wider on a top. A lip. It's a lip, bro. Oh, lip. that's a good way of describing it, yeah. But, yeah, that's what a flange is. Yeah, so, like, and this fr flange um, reduces friction on the dead axle that they're using. Um, if You know, we, we talked about sha axles and shafts in the earlier lesson, but they're, they're running a dead axle here, which means that the axle itself, which is this, um, uh, I think, aluminum tube, um, th this gray aluminum tube, um, it doesn't move. It's actually bolted to the like a plate on their gear gearbox, um, which you know it prevents. It helps with uh, with cantilever. It reduces cantilever, and which is a term that we talked about uh, in our last lesson. Cantilever just the amount of um, shaft that kind of is that sticks out beyond a point of retention. So it's do you see if you see how it's retained on all sides? How there's no there's nothing that sticks out, right? on that shaft and so therefore they're like it's it's, it's all very, fully supported uh, like the shaft exactly, is all fully yeah. supported by this side and by that side yeah and if you notice there isn't a bearing actually on from the on the shaft to, um sorry connecting that shaft to the plates that it's attached to so that's why that's how you know it's dead axle because the shaft isn't supposed to move it's a fixed in place and so that's why they can't they need the, that um those um bushings is to reduce that friction on that dead axle. 
And so, um, yeah, then they, ha they, they um, drive the arm with the sprocket. And so that, I think that makes a successful pivot. Um, wait, actually, there's, there's another slide that we want to talk about. Yeah, there is. Um, um, so here, if I... I mean, I, I think I already kind of talked about it unconsciously. Um, it was just talking about the, stru the structural um, components of it. Yeah, just bearing the shaft retention. Um, yeah, re again, reducing cantilever is really important. Um, when you want to have a really sturdy pivot, especially one that's supporting like an entire arm, um, and uh, uh, clearances. Oh, if you see here, they they have a something that I thought was um, was, you know, it, I mean, like this is this is pretty standard practice, but they have a um, what's it called? A plate separating the, like a, a, where they mount the sprocket to. Um, well, sorry, that, that mounts the sprocket to the arm, and that act, that both helps mount the sprocket with its um, kind of weird mounting profile, and also it helps um, space it out so that the chain has clearance and won't like um, interfere with the 2x1 the shaft, the 2x1 uh, tube stock. Yeah, so they've got a little plate here that sits between the sprocket and the actual thing here. Let me isolate that. So this plate sort of just sits between the sprocket and the arm, allowing for the chain not to interfere with the tubing. Yeah, and, and okay, and even though like... Um, Citrus circuits, they have um, they have a lot of machining access, and they, so they, they machine all their tube stock with this uh, very cool hole, hole pattern, and they can easily modify that whenever they want. Um, in in a case for like a low resource team where you don't have that uh, machining access, um, having a plate to help attach that is help uh, mount that is really smart because you can um, you can just precisely drill um, holes on the on the small plate with um, you know with measuring and, and hand tools, and then just Drill clearance holes on the on the two by one act um, two by two by one tube stock. Yep. All right. So that brings us to our homework. So our homework for today, number one, everyone should still finish that on shape learning pathway if they haven't already. Um, just so you're fundament, um, I guess familiar with CAD, because sooner soon we're gonna sort of get into more advanced projects where we'll, where you'll actually be designing parts of robots. And so, so, for today, what we're going to have you do is actually look through some examples of CAD we're going to send out later. And what we want you to do is um, actually look, th look at power transmission. So how are they transferring power? What types of axles they're using? How those axles are mounted? Um, what, what they're using to reduce friction? So are they using bushings in some places, bearings in some places? Um, are they live axle or dead axle? It's just anything else you notice about the design, anything that's cool, any questions you have. Uh, yeah, so um, for whoever wasn't there, um, basically what the Onshape learning pathway is, here I'll just open up Onshape real quick. Uh, Onshape is going to be the, the, the tool that we're going to be using for CAD um, throughout this entire course, so I suggest you get familiar with it. Yeah, um, here, give me, actually, I already have it open in a window. Give me one second. Uh, I'm just going to wait. Wrong window. Uh, wait, that was not it either. Wait, that is it. Here, I'm just going to see if I'm, nope, not logged in. Oh, wow, shit. dude, this, this, this feels like uh, when teachers, when they try to, like, open their, like, teams or whatever, and they accidentally click their yeah. email. And <laughs> the main reason I don't want to open my general screen um, is just because I'm, I have some like internship stuff I can't exactly show on here, so there's that. Um, not internship, but um, something that I can't share. So, Thanks. yeah. Um, so, uh, here... So in Onshape, when, when you open it, there's a button called Learning Center in the top right corner. So here, um, if you hit that Learning Center button, um, you can see all these trainings. And in here, there's this Onshape Pathways thing. We'll link it um, in the Discord server. But yeah, they've got courses and stuff. Um, and we would suggest 
doing all the courses eventually, but I think the most important one is the, uh, I think, yeah, the Entree Fundamentals, the CAD, um, the, the CAD course. And, like, that'll just get you uh, very familiar with all the tools that Onshape very graciously provides us and all the different features that um, we can use. Yeah, so that's sort of everything. Just finish that um, CAD Fundamentals and look through some examples of CAD. Um, yeah. I guess thank you all awesome. so much for coming out and watching the stream and we're excited to see you next week. Bye.